it's it can be a sign that you're doing something right if your character has this sense of agency and they're kind of telling you no this is not what I would do you know so I think that's why it's important to have a flexible outline meaning that if your character starts to do different things than you had planned then just zoom out and go back to your outline and adjust the way forward oh, you know, like so you're, yeah so you're still writing toward an end point but it's it can be whatever you want Welcome to the Fiction Writing Made Easy podcast. My name is Savannah Gilbo, and I'm here to help you write a story that works. I want to prove to you that writing a novel doesn't have to be overwhelming. So each week, I'll bring you a brand new episode with simple, actionable, and step-by-step strategies that you can implement in your writing right away. So whether you're brand new to writing or more of a seasoned author looking to improve your craft, this podcast is for you. So pick up a pen and let's get started. In today's extra special bonus episode, I wanted to share an interview I did earlier this year with Dr. Susan Hickman for the Conquering the Writing Blues Summit. This was such a fun event to be a part of because not only is it always fun to talk about writing, but there were also 20 plus other speakers, including best-selling authors, editors, book coaches, and publishing professionals who each shared their favorite insights, tips, and strategies on the writing, editing, and publishing process. So it was a super fun event, and it was really great to hear what everyone had to say about the different parts of the writing, editing, and publishing process. If you want to check out the recordings from the summit, you can go to www.therightcause.net to listen and learn more. I will link to that in the show notes for you guys if you're interested in accessing all the other recordings from that day. But now without further ado, here is my interview with Dr. Susan Hickman. Welcome everyone to Conquering the Writing Blues. This is your host, Dr. Susan Hickman. Today's interview is a real treat. You'll hear from Savannah Gilbo, a developmental editor and book coach. What I loved about this interview is that Savannah's heart and her expertise shine through. You'll learn about the purpose of developmental edits, how book coaching assists the writer through stuck points, and ways to work your way out of the perfectionism trap or the I-don't-know-where-to-start doldrums. And did I mention raw encouragement and unbridled enthusiasm? Savannah joins us for her interview via Zoom. Welcome, Savannah, to Conquering the Writing Blues. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'd like to start out, if you don't mind, by just letting you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started working with writers. Sure. So my name is Savannah Gilbo, and I'm a developmental editor and book coach, which basically means I help people write, edit, and publish their books. Okay. And I, I do that through services like a manuscript evaluation or outline critiques all the way to one-on-one coaching. Okay. And um, I actually became a developmental editor in the first place because I wanted to write my own fiction. And I thought if I could just get everything figured out and how the process works, then it would okay. be easier for me. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I kind of fell in love with it and totally changed careers. I used to work in a corporate job and you know, just fell in love with the whole thing. I wanted to surround myself with books, whether I'm writing them or helping people write theirs or, you know. Oh, um, I do know. I do know. (laughs) You're speaking my language, girl. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so I became a developmental editor. I got certified through the story grid. And then I realized that there were a whole bunch of people on the other end of the spectrum who needed help at the very start of the project, not just like when they have a final draft. Mm -hmm. So then I went out and became a certified book coach so that I could kind of just meet writers wherever they're at and then help them get to the end and accomplish their goals. So whatever that looks like for them, like finish a draft or, you know, send queries out to agents or whatever that might be. Okay. All right. And then if someone go back to something you just said, developmental editing, I think um, some people may not understand the different types of editing. So just say a little bit about that. What What is your job as a developmental editor? Sure. So as a developmental editor, I look at the big picture of a story, things like what's the genre and do does the writer have all those obligatory scenes and conventions of the genre, you know, things that readers are going to expect from a book of that genre. And then, you know, things like structure, character arcs, theme, uh, point of view. So just all these big picture elements that really need to work together to create a cohesive story. Um, and then, you know, on the next level down, we look at things like scene structure and is each scene doing what it needs to do to the best of its ability in the story. 
Um, okay. So it's really just helping writers kind of polish up all of those elements and figure out how to make their story the best it can be. All right. And is that something that you learned with the story grid? Yeah. So Sean Coyne is the creator of the story grid. It's like an editing methodology. He taught a handful of us editors how to edit a story that's, you know, either almost done or a like full first draft. And it's just kind of like this framework. You look at those big elements, like I mentioned earlier, and just see, okay, what's already working and what's kind of, what needs some help, right? Okay. So yeah, it, it helps guide the writer on like what, what to do next, right? <laughs> Okay. And so is that what you're referring to as a manuscript evaluation? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. And then that is that different then from an outline critique? Is it, again, it sounds like an outline critique is looking at the big picture of where the story's going. Yeah. So it's interesting because you look at the same elements in a manuscript evaluation as you would an outline critique, but mm-hmm. um, the outline critique is kind of just a way for writers to uh, I guess, avoid spending all the time writing a first draft when they could have fixed some things up front. Okay. You know, so it's kind of the same elements, just different times in the process. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> this makes me want to ask the question because you hear so many different points of view on it. Outline, organic writing, yeah. yes, outline, no outline. So uh, you get to put way in and give your two cents. <laughs> Yeah. So it's funny because as a book coach, I work with people who are all along that spectrum of plotter and pantser, right? Okay. And um, I Isn't have, it funny that that's what we call it? I know, right? And so I have to say that I'm a huge outliner because I don't want to waste time or like, you know, just kind of spin my wheels if I don't have a roadmap. But I also feel like I'm very creative. So I... I like to have some kind of outline that um, gives me a roadmap, but doesn't necessarily tell me what the details of each scene is going to be, because I feel like I can still have that guiding light almost, but then be creative when I get to the scene level. And then of course, like things can change in my outline, right? Um, So that's kind of what I do with the writers I work with. We create a flexible outline that allows them to get creative at the scene level. And then of course, go back and adjust their outline if their story takes a different direction. Yeah, and it makes sense to me, um, you know, that you have, need to have some idea mm-hmm. where you're going. But to me, one of the most amazing things about <laughs> writing that I love is you think you know what you're going to have this <laughs> character do. Yeah. <laughs> and then they absolutely refuse to do it. I mean, yeah. I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it any other way yeah. than that. And so obviously as part of the creative process that's springing from somewhere, but I will always have a character who's going to mess up my outline. For <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. So is that what you mean when you say the outline needs to be flexible? Yeah. And it's so funny because I think that happens to everybody where their character just kind of has a life of their own, right? Yes. And they have their own mind. And it's, it can be a sign that you're doing something right if your character has this sense of agency and they're kind of telling you, no, this is not what I would do, you know? So I think that's why it's important to have a flexible outline, meaning that if your character starts to do different things than you had planned, then just zoom out and go back to your outline and adjust the way forward. Oh, you know, I like so that. Yeah, so you're still writing toward an end point, but it's, it can be whatever you want, right? right. I like that <laughs> a lot. That's great. Now, do you do the same process with uh, fiction and nonfiction? No, or? I usually, yeah, I only work with fiction authors. Okay, okay. All right, so this is primarily fiction okay yeah well there's and there's such a thing as creative nonfiction. definitely um, yeah and and so where do you feel like some of these same elements would apply yeah and it's really interesting because I don't always take on memoir clients but I do work with memoir people sometimes mm-hmm. and we still apply these same things so like what kind of if you had to put your kind of memoir into a box of a genre what would that look like And then we kind of use those genre guidelines as like um, almost a roadmap. And then, of course, you know, it doesn't have to be followed to a T. But I feel like a lot of these same principles and these same like the lens of looking at a story can apply to creative nonfiction. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So in terms of the coaching, and again, I I feel like some of our listeners are not going to know what a book coach is (laughs) or what the role of a book coach. And maybe there's different different types. Um, if you're coaching someone who's writing a book, 
are you helping them with content? Because I know this is a question I have gotten before. Yeah. Or is this really back really to the outline uh, critique? Well, and it, this depends on the type of writer I'm working with. So there are people who really just need the kind of accountability that a coach can offer them and the like week by week support. And they might not want a lot of um, input on their story. But then there are other people on the opposite side who are kind of like, I can show up every day for the writing, but I get stuck. So can you help me brainstorm? You know, here's what I kind of know is going to happen. Here's what I want to happen, but I don't really know the pieces in between. So okay. everybody's different. And I think that's the really fun part about my job as a coach is I can kind of dive in with them wherever they're at and get a feel for their style and what they need and then adapt to whatever they need. Okay. And do you feel like, um, how, how long has book coaching been a thing? Like, I feel like I've only heard about it in the last year or two. Yeah. You know, I'm not actually sure of that answer because, um, I, so I learned about book coaching, you know, a couple years ago, maybe two or three years ago. And that was through the author accelerator program. They certify coaches over there. And, um, even Jenny Nash, the creator will say herself, like book coaching is a thing that not a lot of people know about, but she's been doing it for a while. Um, and then there's like people who, you know, they say they're developmental editors, but they kind of do this like hybrid coaching and editing. So, okay. you know, I'm not really sure the correct answer, but I think it's getting a lot more um, visibility right now. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if that has to do with all the um, upsurgence in indie publishing. Yeah, probably. Probably. Because, you, you know, if people who are independently publishing are not going to have those developmental edits from a publisher. You know, they're not going to have that kind of feedback. So it yeah. probably just opened up a market. For sure. And either, they won't have those kind of deadlines either that they're working towards, you know, exactly. so they kind of have to impose them upon themselves and then get help to hold themselves accountable, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. I'm a psychologist and a coach as well. And even myself, I mean, I, I am very ambitious and I love <laughs> to stay busy, Yeah, but I won't get things done in the same time frame if I'm not accountable to somebody. For sure. I, I think that's just human nature. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and it can just be, you know, it, it, for me, it can even be a friend going, okay, I'm going to call you next week. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, so that accountability piece is a big deal. Yeah, it's it, huge it for is. sure. And I'm, I'm the same way. Like I, you know, I could set a deadline for myself and I might not always hit it because it's like you said, you have no one like really checking on you. So why should you finish it? You know? Well, yeah. Um, we can always think of something else we'd rather yeah, do. <laughs> for sure. Now, what do you think people are most uh, fearful of? Why, why don't more people get a coach? Why, why is that a scary idea for some people? Um, you know, I feel like a lot of people are kind of worried that they're going to be judged or their work is going to be judged. And I think that's like a totally valid fear, right? Because none of us want to be judged. And then we're working with this, like our little book baby, right? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of only been in our head and it's, it feels scary to put it out in the world. Um, so I think that's probably, probably one part of it. And then the other part is like, they don't, they don't want to know that they're doing something that is going to crush this dream of being a writer, I guess. So they're always worried that it's going to kind of go the negative route instead of like, oh, I can get help and I can develop these skills, you know, and, ha and have like a more positive outlook on it. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And it, it, it goes back to what I was discussing with one of the other interview interviewees, Roy Peter Clark, who teaches mm -hmm. writing. And, and we were having the same discussion of, you know, we've all, I'm sure you have as well, I've experienced being in writers' conferences and writers' groups where the person, you know, leading it basically just gets up and says, you, you know, says to, to effect, you should all just quit. You're never yeah. going to be published. Your work is going to suck. You know, and so, you know, it's like, Which is terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. I think writers are some of the most important people in the world. If you look historically, the, the role in society uh, that people sure. who were who were literate first of all you know was a yeah. big deal um, and then to be able to write your ideas down meant you had a lot of influence and so I think writers play an incredibly valuable role so part of my joy in doing this summit is really to help build writers up and and give everybody the opportunity you know, to have a voice. So yeah. I think that fear of rejection of their work, like you say, it's not really 
for me, it's not really about whether you like this, this scene that I have written. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So it's like, okay, I can fix the scene. So it's not, it's not really even criticism of a way I'm doing a particular thing. I think it goes back to what you said, which was you don't have what it takes to be a writer. Yeah, because it almost feels like you're being rejected in your dreams, yes. right? Yes. And it, yeah, and it's, I work with a lot of writers who've said that they've been a part of critique groups or even like online Facebook groups where they've just been like so shut down and critiqued in such a negative way that there are like, they've lost all hope. And to me, that is just so sad, right? And yes. I, and something you said earlier about how we have the ability to influence people with our stories, like I think about myself as a young woman, you know, growing up when I was 13 and my parents were getting divorced and I didn't have like an adult figure to go to for this kind of guidance and, you know, um, for advice, right? And so I turned to books and like, what would I have done if someone like JK Rowling or whoever decided I just am going to listen to all these people and not write a book? Right. And all the, you know? all the publishers that rejected her. I mean, it could have easily yeah. have never been out in the world. For sure. And like, I always tell people that your book, whatever you're working on could be that for somebody else someday. And like, isn't that the coolest thing ever? Yes. <laughs> and for me sometimes, cause I'm a perfectionist and I get worried about the same things that the writers I work with worry about. Like just because I'm an editor and a book coach doesn't mean I don't worry about my work being judged. But when I think about the effect that this story I write could have on somebody someday, like that is what keeps me going. So that's what I always try to do with the writers I work with is like, what do you imagine that the effect that your story is going to have on somebody? And like, how can you use that as fuel to get to the end? You know, Mm -hmm. because sometimes taking yourself out of the picture and like working as like your story is going to be a gift to somebody. Sometimes that can really help us get out of our head. You know, I totally agree. You know, I, and I, The way I have referred to it in the past is books for me, it was the same thing as for you. As a child, I lived in an extremely harsh, non-loving environment. And so there was no validation from there. And I love to read. I would literally bring, you know, 20 books a week home (laughs) to read. And those books opened a window. Yeah. Right. Not just to another place, but that there could be people who behaved very differently. You know, mm-hmm. then my family, we literally are opening a window. So let's say your, your book is about domestic violence mm-hmm. and, and how you handled it and how you got out of it. You're out of it. You're opening a window. And I, I yeah. think that's so crucial. Well, and I mean, to that point, like, even if that book about domestic violence isn't 100% perfect, it's still going to impact somebody in a positive way. Yes. Right. And right. so that's like something I always have to keep in mind. And I always tell the writers I work with, like, you know, even something that you consider to be B plus work could still be like an A plus 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 to somebody else because it changes their life. And what's important is you get it out there, you know, so it's kind of like, you know, you have to have courage, but you also have to have this belief that in the power of story, right? Right. Yes. So. Yeah. And, and I think as individuals, you know, we put a part of ourselves into our stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, we are serving those people. And I do think, going back to something that you said earlier, that if we can remember that, that the right person will pick that up yeah. at the right time, it helps us to push through this desperate need for, you know, for perfection. We as writers have that kind of impact on other people as well. Yeah. And it's so cool. Like for me, that's just one of the things that keeps me going, you know, and I just like, I think all of us would say that if our book could have the kind of impact on somebody that some certain books in our lives have had like that impact on us, that's kind of the dream, right? Yes. Yes. So. <laughs> and so we keep after it. We absolutely yeah. keep after yeah. it. So what do you see in your experience, because you've, you know, working with a lot of writers now, what do you mm-hmm. see them really struggle with? Well, um, you're right. It is along these same lines because I think one of them for sure is that perfectionism. And that's something that I struggle with a lot. So I'm going to say my example and then I'm sure people can relate to it, but sometimes it's hard for me to kind of start a project if I don't have everything figured out. Mm -hmm. So if I have an idea for a character or like a beginning of a story, but not the end and, you know, just these little pieces, instead of like sitting down and kind of working through it, I might let the story what I call marinate, which is kind of an excuse, right? But I'm like, oh, it's marinating in my mind. I'll get to it someday. 
you know, and then I don't end up doing anything. So I see a lot of writers who do that. And I think that all roots back in that perfectionism, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also see a lot of writers who are kind of really focused on the wrong thing at the wrong time. So like they'll start a project and they'll just really agonize over like, how, how can I write this sentence more beautifully? Or how can I get this first page really perfect? Right. And then they don't even have this bigger picture story figured out. So they repeat this process of working on the same first sentence or same first page for weeks or months. And then nothing ever happens. Like they never get to the end. Part of my work as a coach is I help people zoom out and say, okay, we're not even going there yet because we need to figure out what your story is about. You know, what genre you're working in, what message do you want to give to readers? What kind of character do you have? Just these big picture elements so that, you know, later on you can go and kind of worry about these sentences and paragraphs and all that. But first you need to figure out where you're going and what you have to say. Yeah. It's like the the message underlies all the action, you know, and you see this a lot in psychology. People will say they have a particular goal, but then they do the complete opposite of that, which tells you that's not really the goal, right? Yeah. Well, and it's so hard too, because like people sit down and they're like, I'm going to write a book, but there's no like instruction manual necessarily for Mm -hmm. writing a book. There's like different methods, like, you know, save the cat or the hero's journey or all this stuff. But it doesn't tell you like what to do really first, second, and third. So you kind of just sit there and you get overwhelmed and confused, you know, and then you, a lot of people give up and that's just, to me, it's terrible, you know? Right. So. <laughs> and so when they're, when they're overwhelmed and confused, do you help them just like pulling back and picking one particular thing? Like, how do you know what it, what you should do first and then second? Is it character? Is it plot? Yeah, so I do think it's kind of a combination of those big picture elements that you just mentioned and, you know, things like genre and picking a point of view, for example, or, you know, all those different things. And it's kind of, it's, I always have the writers I work with kind of answer these questions like, what's your genre? What do you think this message is? Talk to me about your main character. And I kind of see what they have. And then if, say, for example, they don't have a theme really developed or a message, then we'll spend a little time kind of just talking about it. And usually the writer will come up with it themselves if they're asked a few questions, you know? So it's like all this stuff lives inside of them, but if they don't know how to channel it into a story, like in these specific steps of like big picture down to small picture, then of course they're going to be overwhelmed and confused, right? Right, right. And I've also loved in one of your emails to me, you know, you were saying these feelings are normal. They're valid. (laughs) Because writing a book is hard. Totally. And it's like, I always tell people you watch the Olympics or you watch like a ballet, right? And you're just amazed at these people who are so talented. And like, you would never show up to a stage and say, I'm going to perform a master ballet dance, right? Right. So it's kind of like, we have to think about it the same way for our books. Like we can admire what a good book is and what books make us feel, but to sit down and say, we're going to do it and expect to do it as well as these other people the first time, you know, like we, we, that's kind of an unrealistic expectation, right? Right. So sure is. it's almost like we have to adjust our mindset, which is a part of, you know, I know what you're talking about on this whole summit is um, we can't expect these things from ourselves that we wouldn't expect in other areas of our life. We wouldn't expect to be a professional athlete on day one. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it goes back to this message that, that I, I think this whole profession of writing tends to uh, exacerbate, which is you either have it or you don't. Yeah. You could be and, a writer or you can't. Yeah. And I don't believe that for a second. I think anybody could do it. You just have to have a realistic expectation of what it's going to take. Right. And you kind of have to have that, that heart almost that like you want it so bad that you're going to put in the time and energy to learn how to do it. Yeah. So are you saying, you know, that, that you believe, uh, Anyone who truly wants to and is willing to listen and learn can learn the elements of writing a good story. For sure. Yeah, I fully believe that. And so from there, we have differences between Hemingway and, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know what I'm saying? So how do we deal with this notion of talent, specialty, special talent? very talented. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's, it's that to me, it's one step beyond the, can you learn the elements of a story? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because it's almost like I'm trying to think of something to compare it to, right? Like we can all learn how to bake a cake, but we're all going to kind of put our unique spin on it. Right. And some people are just going to, they're going to have it. It's going to consume them and it's going to be in their heart to just create something that's like, you know, all they're going to put everything they have into it. Right. And I think there's, there's this spectrum of writers who, and I've worked with a lot of people who are kind of on this, like, this is just really fun for me. And it's not like, my life's work, but I really enjoy doing it. Right. So they're, they're probably never going to strive to be Hemingway and they're okay when they don't produce something that Hemingway would, you know, and then there's other people who are like, this is the one thing that kind of runs my life. And I just love it more than anything else, you know? And so they dedicate themselves to honing their voice or learning these kind of more advanced elements of the craft. And I kind of think that's where the difference is. Right. Um, And then there's a whole ton of people in the middle of that spectrum. Right, right. And and I guess the message that, you know, that I would want to send is, yes, some people come to it with a way with words that is just inexplicable. I mean, there's just their language is like poetry. And so, you know, it is true that you will run across writers like that that just just touch you in a different way. So there is something uh, to be said for the service of writing and learning the elements well. And it doesn't mean if you're not a Hemingway that you do not have something valuable to offer. And I guess that's for sure. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is someone asked me on Twitter the other day, they're like, is it, uh, is it true that certain people don't like lyrical, you know, or like this poetic kind of writing in these beautiful words. And so it sparked this whole like discussion. And some people were like, yeah, I love that. And then other people were like, I don't really care. I just like the story. Yeah, you know, it can be. Yes. And so there is like a version of either this like gourmet cake or a homemade cake out there for everybody, yes. right? And like not everyone's going to love what Hemingway does just because, or like even something like Pride and Prejudice that's a classic, not everybody's going to love that. Right. You know? right. So yeah. there's room for everybody, I guess, right? Yes. And that's where I was really going yeah. with all that. <laughs> I want people to feel empowered, you know, yeah. that we all have a story to tell. And, you know, before we started writing stuff down, this was all verbal. Yeah, but definitely. We, you know, we passed our history by story. Yeah, definitely. So you also talked about uh, perfectionism. So for those who get bogged down, if I don't know what the whole story is about, and if I don't know where I'm going, if I don't know where the character arc, they mm-hmm. just walk away from it. So mm-hmm. once you had a particular solution that I thought was really good. Yeah. So I always think about these like five big elements, I would say. So I think, do I know my genre? So for example, you might say, yes, I know I'm writing a romance. And if you know you're writing a romance, there's certain things that you can gather that readers are going to expect from a romance. So you can kind of start shaping a plan based off just that one question, right? Right. And maybe you can ask yourself, do I know who my character is, my protagonist? And have I imagined kind of some kind of arc they're going to go through in the story? And the answer might be yes or no, but at least, you know, you're kind of giving yourself a jumping off point. And then um, let's see, number three is kind of what have I imagined is going to happen in my story? So like what kind of plot have I imagined? And you might have answers or you might not. Um, Question number four is what kind of message do I want to leave readers with? So you know, you might have something to say about friendship or grief and loss or domestic violence, like you were saying earlier. Um, But just kind of gathering all these pieces of what I know and don't know is a huge step in the right direction, right? Right. And then I think number five is probably like some version of what kind of point of view or how am I going to tell this story? So am I going to have one character and I need kind of one character arc? Or am I going to have three point of view characters and I might need three point of or three character arcs, you know? So just kind of thinking, what do I have to work with and what do I not have? And it's, if we talk about baking cakes again, which I don't know why I got off on this. cake. (laughs) You know, if you said, I want to make a cake today and you look in your cabinet and you're like, what do I already have? And what do I need? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I like So I, and I like to start big picture because imagine if you haven't really thought about any of that and you start writing, you might make it two pages and you're like, what am I doing? You know, Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how I like to get going or get unstuck. Okay. Okay. And, and then one of the other things that I noticed, um, I can't remember if I saw it on your website or if it was in the email, but you're just Mm -hmm. talking about if I'm stuck in that perfectionist mindset, it just 
getting something down. Yeah. And, you know, keeps you from being just frozen. Um, yeah. And it's, it's funny because the writers I work with, like they might not, they might feel completely frozen when it comes to their outline or doing something that feels, I'm going to use air quotes here, but like official, like I'm actually writing my book. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't always have to go there. You could sit there and like write a page about how you feel about your character or, you know, what the message of your story means to you. Like if I was writing about loss, what do I have to say about that? You know, so you can just kind of start getting these things out of your head and usually it's going to kind of spur you into motion, you know? Right, right. And then I think another suggestion you had was um, writing a scene as opposed to even thinking about a chapter. Yeah, um, I always tell people to write in scenes and not chapters because if we think in terms of a chapter, we feel this pressure that's like, I have to start it in a really interesting way and I have to end it on the perfect sentence, you know, and I have to maybe do a cliffhanger. Like we have all these expectations of what chapters are, but they're really just kind of these arbitrary breaks in a story to control how the reader experiences it. Mm -hmm. So, and then on the other hand, we have scenes, which are kind of these mini units of story that have like their own arc of change. So if we can kind of sit there and start thinking about what each scene needs to be and how to write a complete scene, we're not yet thinking of how do we break this apart to, you know, control how the reader thinks and feels at this moment. We're just thinking about our story, you know? So it's kind of like step one and then we can worry about chapters later. And I feel like that just takes a lot of pressure off people when they're just stressing over like, I want to have this many chapters and I want quotes at the beginning of the chapter. And you know, they're just thinking about all this stuff and you're like, you don't need to go there yet. (laughs) Right. Take a break, go back to step one. (laughs) Yeah. And I find, I was wondering if you had this experience as well, that, that just, Writing a scene, even one I know I'm not going to have in the story. It might be a scene between two primary characters that fills in the backstory for me. Mm-hmm. Even though it never goes in the book, it also really helps me deepen my understanding of these characters. So yeah, I think scenes can play a lot. And I've even used, honestly, I've even used scene writing um, in therapy with clients. Just, I just, bet, yeah. Um, yeah, just write this, like, for example, if their father is dead and there was, you know, so many things I wanted to say to their father, write a scene for me with the dialogue. Yeah. What would you say? And it's very powerful. Um, yeah. And I think I can totally imagine that being useful in therapy. And it's almost like sometimes I laugh that I'm like a character, character therapist in my job, because sometimes I'll do the same thing with like, write a scene about how this character feels about X, Y, Z that happened, you know? Um, but I also think like writing in scenes is such a great way to practice this kind of like narrative arc. Because if you say each scene needs to have this arc, you're not, you're, each act needs to have an arc too. And so does your overall story. So if you can kind of master that arc on a scene level, you're going to be better equipped to write a better story. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. 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 No, that <laughs> makes perfect sense. And it makes perfect sense why you would do it. Yeah. Okay. So here's a fun question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Who, what type of client has been the most difficult for you to deal with? Most difficult. So I think the type of writer that's difficult is someone that thinks they probably should get help, but they don't really want it. So they maybe don't have like this kind of growth mindset, whether that, you know, results in them kind of just wanting validation that their idea is good, but no constructive criticism, or they kind of just want to argue with you about it. And you're like, well, why did you ask me for help? You know? Okay. Um, So yeah, that's it. Just someone who is not very, who doesn't really want to get better, right? Okay. So interesting. So they're really just looking for validation. Um, Yeah. Or just like they feel like they're ticking the box of working with an editor, but they don't, they don't value why that would be important, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I think that you wanted to mention something um, for the listeners, a a, a gift or an offer you would like to give. Yes. So I have a little workbook that since we talked about perfection earlier and how I really suggest that the writers listening to this kind of focus on these big picture elements first and not really zoom into the micro details. Mm -hmm. I put together a workbook that will help you. There's a couple questions that'll help you uh, really dial in that big picture of your story so that you can feel kind of confident either moving your next step of outlining or if you're more of a pantser than kind of writing that first draft. Okay. Um, so it, 
if you guys want to download that, you can go to savannahgilbo.com forward slash myths, M-Y-T-H-S myths. Well, this has been so much fun and fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much, Savannah, for joining us on Conquering the Writing Blues. And I and appreciate all of your heart for, for teaching and, and helping writers. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. So that's it for today's show. As always, I want to thank you so much for tuning in and showing your support. If you want to check out any of the links I mentioned in this episode, you can find them over at savannahgilbo.com forward slash podcast. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the show because there's going to be another brand new episode coming out next week. If you're an Apple user, I'd really appreciate it if you took a few seconds to leave a quick rating and review. Your ratings and reviews tell iTunes that this is a podcast that's worth listening to. And in turn, that helps this show get in front of more fiction writers just like you. So that's it for today's show. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, happy writing.